Good morning, City Gates. How is everyone doing this morning? <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> All right. Well, please find your spots. Find a seat. There's lots of open spots and empty seats here that you can find. Okay. And let's all stand together as we worship. Getting better. Won't take long, just in case you want me to sit down already. I won't take long, I promise. Psalm 119. I just read this this morning. Not the whole thing, you're fortunate to know. One verse, 32. He says this. He says, I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. Another, pas another translation of that says... For you set my heart free. He said, I will run the way of your commandments, for you set my heart free. Wow. You know, everybody's looking for freedom, and nobody can find it outside of Jesus. And we have an incredible internal freedom that is not circumstantial. Our life can fall apart, but we can still run in the way of His commandments because He set 
our heart free. Why don't we worship him like free people? Cool? I love singing this song in the morning because it says awakens me. And some of us are barely awake. So let's sing as if we are awake and well. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love
we sing this next song it's called Waymaker I just wanted to share just an encouragement from uh, my own life uh, just how God has made a way pretty recently um, as many of us uh, who've, who've got um, a house and a mortgage you know that interest rates are crazy <laughs> and um, me and, and Vera were up for renewal this year and um, it was going to jump to some insane uh, level. And so we were kind of just looking around going, I don't know, God, how we're going to do this. Like, realistically, like, I don't know how we're actually going to financially kind of do this. We're really going to have to, you know, uh, tie down some things. And, yeah, we were just kind of at a place where we didn't know what to do. And um, so I called the bank, you know, to set up a meeting to kind of go through all this stuff. And, um, you know, I gave him my name and gave him my, you know, account number and things like that. And the lady goes, uh, you're not up for renewal for another two years. And I didn't quite understand what she meant. I was like, are you sure? Like one, two, three, you know, like, are you sure <laughs> this is the place? Uh, and she's like, yeah. And I was like, my name's Corey. Like, are you sure? Like. This is the right thing. And uh, I mean, I think I asked her like seven or eight more questions just to ensure that it was me. <laughs> um, and she just, she, she just kind of laughed. And uh, she's like, yeah, it's not up for another two years. You guys did like some interim renewal thing back a few years ago, which I don't even know why we did that. I don't remember why we had to do that. But somehow we had renewed for like another five years and I just, <laughs> the look me and Vera gave each other. I mean, it's it was God's provision in our life. Like, little did we know all those years back that that was just something that God would make a way for us now. Um, we never knew that we would be, you know, hard-pressed and interest rates would rise like this. So I just, I just wanted to share that just to encourage us that God makes a way. <laughs> and things that he is doing now, I mean, he might be planting seeds into our future to make a way for us then, if not right now. So let's have faith that even now God is working. We might not see him, but he's working. You are 
here turning lives around I worship you I worship you you are here filling every heart I worship you Corey shared a testimony that encouraged us. And uh, I'm not going to strip this because this could be remarkably awkward moments when nobody comes forward. But I, just, I do want you to know that we need more and more stories of God's grace and provision in your life. So uh, please feel free to you know, come and see me or somebody else, either during, before, after the service, anytime. Anytime you have a, something that needs to be shared to encourage other people, um, let's make this a place where people are encouraged. Let's not make it just one person gets to do that, but whoever else. I mean, if there is somebody to just say, that's me, I'm cool with that. You can come up and share whatever you feel is in, would encourage people. I will kind of put up with the one that needs to be unraveled with the, you know, 10 that really helps. So <laughs> I'm not going to script it. Like, it doesn't matter. Come up. We can, uh, you know, we can kind of walk people through it afterwards if necessary. But I just want to encourage you that this is a safe place for you to come in uh, and share what God is doing. We love these stories of encouragement. That is a miracle story. That's a won't be able to live in this house, can now live in this house story. That's pretty crazy. And so uh, I think we need to shout some of those things from the rooftop. So if there's anybody else, uh, we'll keep praising, uh, keep watching, but feel free to come up to me. Uh, ongoing, we will be doing this. So. There was a moment when the light 
lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake What sacrifice was made as the heavens rolled? All hail, King Jesus! All hail, Lord of heaven and earth! All
just wanted to share, um, recently my wife reminded me of a verse, Isaiah 54, verse 17. And probably most of you know it. It's that verse that talks about, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. When you think about prosper, if we think about it, it really talks about death, you know, where it's going to actually succeed. If you read the verses beforehand, God talks to the people and says, you know, I'm the one who makes the blacksmith and makes the coals and makes the fire and I'm the one who makes you know created the person who yields the weapon and it doesn't always mean that you'll come out of things without scars or without wounds but the, the issue is that your soul is not taken a couple years ago as you know I uh, got the got the news that you know a weapon had been formed against me right went through cancer all that stuff. And, um, you know, I have scars. I have, I have wounds that will never heal. But you can choose whether those wounds are places that you look at and look at loss. And I've had to battle that. Or you can look at them and go, that's a reminder point for God. And I think, you know, I've pondered this word for a week, week and a half, and I think there's other people here that feel that there's a weapon that's formed against them right now and that they're struggling to fight against it. But I want to encourage you that God just, he never leaves you. He's always there. It might look like you're defeated. It might look like you're down to your last, but he never comes too late. It's always at the right time. And I just encourage you, this is a great place to come together with your brothers and your sisters to join together to take your burdens and your cares and lay them at the feet of the king. Because he takes them, you know, the beautiful thing is he takes your burden and turns it back into beauty for you. Gold or rubies or whatever. He just... He transforms it before your eyes in beauty. The question is, will you give it to him? Because he can't and he won't transform it unless you give it to him. So I just encourage you, find someone. Share what you're going through. Be vulnerable and bring that before God. good God we have. Mm. No weapon formed against us shall stand. Thanks, Dean. Yeah. Mm. Jesus, thank you for meeting us here. Spirit, thank you for being with us. We need you. <laughs> We'll never stop needing you. So please continue to meet with us here today and deal with us and transform us and conform us to the image of Christ. Please, we rely on you. We love you. In your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Great. Thanks for uh, stepping out and sharing that, Dean. We appreciate it very much. And that's kind of that's kind of what church looks like. It looks like people talking about uh, how the King has rescued them from disaster. We all have been, if we're a Christ follower. And so, uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Well, good morning again. Welcome to City Gates. And uh, children have already left miraculously. They don't even need a queue. 
Uh, if you're a guest with us, um, thank you for joining us. Please fill out our online guest card, citygates uh, slash guest dot ca or slash ca dash guest, whoever, that one right there. It's so much slashing going on right here. So, <laughs> all right, so you can register for your guest. Community groups, um, community groups look like a microcosm of this. So if you're not part of a community group, um, what, how Dean came up and shared would be more common actually in a smaller group where people would share some of their challenges. It's not just that, there's also great times of celebration, there's times of study. Uh, it's not one dimensional, but it's certainly open to people uh, in that context sharing some of their different life challenges as Dean did today. And so thank you for that midweek. Uh, in homes, uh, citygates.ca slash groups. You can find one online and register. And come and visit us. Okay, so last week was the last week that we were showing... Oh, no, that's a guest card. I'm sorry. I can't even read that. Uh, we still have a lot of these. Nobody's taking them. So maybe today take a few and just keep them... I'm not asking you to do a, a campaign. If just somebody says, hey, where do you guys meet? All you do is give them that. It's really simple because... Nobody expects a church to meet in a pub, just so you know that. It's quite a shock for people when they realize we're meeting in a pub. Next. Yeah, and thank you for generosity again. Uh, we're certainly coming out the other side of a, a tough time, and financially you guys have been incredibly faithful. So if you're a regular giver, you can do it online, citygates.ca slash give, and uh, please uh, continue to give generously. And I think that's it. Corey is sharing. Uh, 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 Tom, come up and pray for Corey. Come up and pray for Corey. That's you. That's you. Which one do I get? All right. Uh, Holy Spirit, we just ask you to speak to us through your servant. Uh, we just thank you that he surrendered himself in his preparation to you, the king, so that your life will flow in this room today. So we just uh, ask you for your anointing upon him and that your scriptures will do what they say they will, which will divide us between joint and spirit and soul and joint and marrow and transform us. So we just speak through Corey. Amen. Thanks, Tom. All right. Check, check. All right. Well, good morning. I haven't done this part of the stage yet, so this will be a little bit new for me. But that's okay. Uh, should I do it here? I'll just do it here. All right. Well, on my way, uh, on my way here this morning, <laughs> I was reminded of a, my son Theo uh, mentioned this absolute '90s classic, Airbud. I don't know if you've ever seen Airbud at all, but it is a cinematic masterpiece <laughs> where a golden retriever carries an elementary school basketball team to the championship. Classic. And Theo loves this movie. Loves it. And I was reminded, though, this morning that Rory, my other son, I, I remember I found it just on, like, Prime or wherever it was, and I was like, oh, Air Bud. And, I, and he was so dead set on watching something else, Rory just looked at me and he was like, I do not want to watch this movie at all. And I said, we're watching it anyways. <laughs> so we turned on this absolute cinematic masterpiece, and we watched it. And I kept asking him throughout. I was like, hey, how do you guys like it now? Like, has your opinion changed? And Theo was glued to it. He was like, I love this thing. And Rory was like, I still don't like this movie, Dad. I don't like this movie at all. And, uh, you know, halfway through, I asked him again. Temperature check, still not liking this movie. I don't know how you don't like Air Bud. All the way towards the end, I ask him, do you like this movie? How did you like it? And he's like, yeah, I did not like that movie. I don't ever want to watch that again. And I was like, okay. 
Theo? And he's like, I loved it. <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. Well, the next morning, I wake up, and all Rory can talk about is Airbud and how he wants to watch it again. Talk about, like, a really bad, like, snap judgment call or judgment call on this particular movie. I mean, even while he was doing it, he's trying to, like, judge the movie based upon what he assumes he wants to watch. It's like, I want to watch this, but... So it was just a terrible, terrible judgment call on his part, wasn't it? <laughs> and now he wants to watch it all the time. But that is what we're going to talk about today. We are going to talk about judging. Judging. I know an exciting topic for us all. Um, but we're going to dive in and see what the Word has for us here. So if you want to open your Bibles to Matthew 7... And we're going to go through verses 1 through 6. It says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So who has heard this before? Maybe show of hands. Maybe you've just heard a piece of this. This is a pretty famous area. I mean, the whole Sermon on the Mount, as we've been kind of going through this, is, is quite popular. But maybe you've heard just that first verse. And maybe, maybe you've been uh, accusing someone of doing something. And they say, hey, man, don't judge me. The Bible tells us not to judge. It says don't judge. It's like, okay, I guess Jesus says don't judge. Uh, or maybe you've been on the, the receiving end of that, and you've said to someone, don't judge me. Only God can judge me. Something like that. Made famous by the rapper Tupac Shakur. <laughs> I'm throwing back to the 90s all day here. This is what we're doing. <laughs> but... As we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, it's filled with a ton of rich content, and we've been seeing a lot of it. And people all over the world, Christians or not, have heard bits and pieces of the Sermon of the Mount. But that can be the problem in of itself, is they've heard pieces, pieces, us too, we've heard pieces, and we totally forget the context in which these pieces sit. I mean, gosh, the amount of error that can come from this, if we look back at the passage on anger, I mean, we might let, be led to believe that we should just never, ever get angry, ever, if we just take one verse. Or with lust, I mean, that's a dangerous one. We might start lopping off body parts that cause us to sin if we just, like, took one verse out of that. Or oaths. P many people have been led to believe to never, ever swear oaths just based on that one line. Retaliation. We might start to think that we're supposed to be pushovers, right? Total pacifists. And I'm not linking those two together. I'm just saying. Ask and it will be given to you. We haven't got there yet. But just that line in of itself, ask and it will be given to you. If we just take that and we take it out of its context, we might start to believe that prayer is kind of like a, a blank check that we write. And then we receive whatever that we write. Well, judging is exactly like this. Many people have heard that first line, judge not, that you not be judged. Or maybe even the first part of the first verse, just judge not, and we just come to think that's what it says. But is that what we just read here? Are we just not supposed to judge? No. No. If we look at verses 2 to 6, we can see what Jesus is most concerned about here is us judging each other hypocritically. 
He's concerned about us judging each other hypocritically. And Jesus seems to come to this conclusion that if we judge wrong, if we judge hypocritically, Jesus sees this as destructive. And he sees that we will not be able to effectively help our brothers and sisters in Christ with their specks, right, with the speck in their eye, that sin issue. If we have a log in our own, if we're walking around with log vision, all right, what is the, how are we seeing the speck in your eye? What part of the body are we using? Anyone? The eye. Where is the log? It's in the eye. So we have a major problem with log vision here, all right? And worse yet, if this is how we're operating, where we're trying to take the speck out of our brother's eye and we have a log in our eye, we might cause them to stumble even more because of our unclear vision. Maybe you remember in Matthew 23, Jesus says, you blind guides. And he's talking to the Pharisees here. And that was the whole, a few weeks back, we went through um, straining out a gnat, but swallowing a camel. It's that same type of hyperbole that he's using here for these sin issues. It's like you're focused on this little speck, and yet you can't even see the gigantic log in your own eye. This kind of thing, it damages our relationships with each other, especially even with the person that we're trying to help. And it's going to hurt them. And it's going to hurt our relationship with God. And this is the kind of stuff that Jesus is calling out. And that's what we're going to go through today. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, Corey, I know some judgmental people. But I am not judgmental. I, I don't judge. But here's the irony. <laughs> that's judgment. <laughs> You've just judged that person to be judgmental. We do this all the time. We can't help but be judgmental. So what, what is judging? What are we talking about when we say that word? And it's quite a complex term in, in Greek, and it's quite a complex term in, in English. It can mean a ton of different things, right? But primarily, when judge is used here in Matthew 7, it's describing two things, two things. Number one, it's describing making a decision. So we can say that to judge, right, is to make a decision. Have you ever formed an opinion about anything? Right? Have you ever had to think through, you know, or listened to music and thought, hmm, I don't really like uh, country music, but I love rock and roll or hip hop or Electronic dance music, you know? <laughs> How about cars? Do you have an opinion about cars? Do you have an opinion about a political figure? Ooh, I won't dive into that one too much. <laughs> but this is all judging. Have you ever gone to the grocery store, to the bread section, and you see all of the choices, and you think, hmm, I'll buy this bread, because this is the one that I need, right? It's a mental Thing. It's making a decision. That's judging. If you're faced with a moral choice, right, so to do something or to not do something, right, and you decide, I'm going to do this thing because I think it's the right decision. I think it's the right decision. This is all judging. This is all judgments that we have to make. So number one, making a decision, judging. Number two, when we make decisions, right, someone who is called upon to act as an authority to make a decision or choose between things is called a judge. That's right. So that's kind of that second layer there. So if you were selected as a judge for a pie contest, right, you would have to take into account all the criteria for pie, <laughs> and you and maybe even a panel of other judges would have to decide which one wins, which one tastes best or looks best based on the criteria, the measure, 
right? For us, acting as a judge even has a, a, a professional setting. You, you could be a judge. You could work in the legal system, right? In a small claims court, possibly, where a judge weighs the evidence that is brought before them, and then they pass a verdict, right? They make a decision on where they think the evidence leads to. So this is the type of judge that is being used here. And these are the two elements that we can think of as we kind of go along. So what are the results of judging each other? You know, we can judge pies, we can judge a lot of different things, but what about when we judge each other? Because this seems to be what Jesus is getting here. Well, when we choose to judge each other based on appearances, attitude, status, judging each other based on decisions someone has made or something that they've said in front of us, sometimes our tendency can be to slot that person into a category. Bigot, arrogant, foolish, unwise, impulsive. And the thing is, is we can do this without thinking. And it totally dehumanizes that person, doesn't it? And once we have our word, our category for that person, we can start just attaching assumptions we have about those types of people. Is this the measure that we want used on us? Is this the type of grace we want extended to ourselves? This type of judging has no place in the kingdom of heaven, in God's people, where we reduce someone's humanity to what category, and then we just discard them, and we just make assumptions about them. I think oftentimes judging has quite a negative connotation, doesn't it? But it's not inherently a bad thing. It's a tool, and it's actually a tool that we must use. We went through tons of examples where we use it every day. It's a tool that we use, must use, especially if we intend to walk together in love as Christians, brothers and sisters. We need each other. We desperately need each other to point out blind spots that are in our lives. I need you to judge me in a loving way when I have a, a total blind spot. Gosh, I hope all of us hope that we would be rescued from areas of sin in our life, right? And us going to one another and judging one another, this is how we help save each other from areas of sin in our life, is it not? We first need to see something and identify, make a judgment that this is not a good way, this is a bad way that someone is going, and I just hope that we would have love enough to step into those situations, right? And so how does Jesus want us to judge? This is kind of what this comes down to, and what's he talking about in Matthew 7? Well, one important element of how to judge actually starts with who we're supposed to judge. This is really, really important. So if we start at verse 3, we're going to catch this. It says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? Now, brother here, it's, we're not talking about blood siblings here, right? Whenever we see brother in here, it's a term that refers to those who are within God's family. Other Christians man or woman. So it's important to remember that the people in these verses that Jesus is talking about are Christians. This is how we are to judge one another. This is not a blueprint for how we judge everyone in the world. I want to make that very clear. 
Paul echoes this in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 5 says, For what have I, this is Paul speaking, For what have I, Paul, to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So God judges those that are outside the church. And this kind of godly method of judging that we're witnessing here in Matthew 7 is not for the rest of the world. And I think this is actually what verse 6 is referring to. If we go down there, it says, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Now I want to pause for a second and say, no, I do not think Jesus is insulting everyone else, saying that they are dogs and pigs. Follow me closely here. I don't think Jesus is insulting people here. But like animals, like the animals that are mentioned here, like they would not know what to do with what is holy or with pearls, What's a pig going to do with pearls, right? Like they would not know what to do with these treasures. So too, people who do not want to follow Jesus, they wouldn't know what to do with these kinds of measures that Christians are using to judge each other. Does that track? I'm going to say that one more time. Like the animals mentioned, wouldn't know what to do with the treasures they've been given. So too, people who do not want to follow Jesus, they want nothing with him. They won't know what to do with these measures that Christians are using to judge each other. Nor do they even care. They may not even care to be held to God's standards by you or you or me. We are to point... I'll, I'm going to stop here for just a second. We are to point the world to God and His goodness. I want to make that very clear. We are not to hold them accountable to standards that they don't want nor they believe, okay? And if people do not turn to God, God will deal with those people ultimately. Does that make sense? It should be our heart to bring these people to God so that one day we could call them brothers and sisters, okay? Please hear me when I say that. And only then, only then, would we start judging each other in love, okay? So with that in mind, when we're talking about approaching a brother and sister in Christ, here is how we're kind of supposed to judge. Here's what this passage is, is referring to. So here's some steps that we can kind of remember. Number one, recognize the log in your eye. Recognize the log in your eye. When we see a sin issue, a speck, in someone else's eye, we first need to deal with that issue in our own lives. We need to do a major, major heart check. All right, verse 5, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. We need to gather ourselves and realize, too, we have a massive sin problem. This is the first thing we do. We go, okay, I see the speck, but God, I acknowledge that I too have a gigantic sin problem. And it could be that my sin problems, my general sin problems, could be way worse than, than my brothers or sisters. And more specifically, what I'm about to judge them on, you could have a major issue with. And we need to check ourselves before we go to someone. And if it comes to be the case that that speck is a log in our own eye, we have got to start dealing with that first. Have you ever been on a plane and those oxygen masks pop down? What do they tell you to do? You put it on your own face first. You don't want to try helping someone else and then pass out in the process. Now you've helped no one. And it's the same thing here. When we've got log vision, we can't help someone. If, that, if we are drowning in that sin ourselves, 
Why would we ever think that we could help someone else with that? What good could we be? I mean, we, could, we would be a blind guide. So we need to first check ourselves. And Galatians 6, 1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, and once again, to know something is a transgression, what do we have to do? We have to judge, right? We have to see, oh, is that? Yes, that is a transgression. You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. So if we have taken that time, we've looked at it, and we're going, no, I'm not drowning in this sin issue. Okay, then we're supposed to approach someone and restore them with gentleness, right? But that last part there, keep watch on yourselves lest you too be tempted. This is why if we have a log in our own eye when we're noticing a speck in someone else's, this can be such a dangerous chain of events. I mean, if you step into someone's world and they're struggling with an issue and you struggle 10 times with that issue, I mean, you guys are going to go down a dark road together. And this could be a destructive spiral. Don't do it. So that's the first thing, is we need to first acknowledge the log in our own eye, the sin issues that we have. And this should immediately put us in position for step two, which is have a posture of humility. Naturally, if this is working correctly, if we are seriously looking at ourselves, this should immediately humble us, should it not? Tim Mackey has this great picture, the guy from the Bible Project, one of the guys. To have a posture of humility means that when we approach each other, when we notice a speck, it is not me and Jesus versus you. It is not me and Jesus versus your speck. That is the wrong posture. You are a judge, not the judge. It's not you, buddy Jesus, versus you, okay? When we approach our brothers and sisters, we need to come down and get with our brother or sisters, and we need to look at Jesus together, okay? This is a posture of humility. It's not me and you versus Jesus. It's me and my brother looking at Jesus together. And this should seek to restore in a spirit of gentleness that person. Next is how we judge others is how you should expect others to judge your own life, which is fairly, <laughs> fairly. Right? So once we've acknowledged this, the, the log in our eye, our own massive sin issues, right? if we've deemed it right that we're not drowning in this issue, then we approach humbly and then we judge fairly. How you judge others is how you should expect others to judge your own life. It should be fair. And here's a massive thing. We, we should not judge beyond what we know. Or what God has said in his word. Have you ever been judged unfairly? Someone has come with an accusation against you. Maybe someone wrongly assumed motives to you. It feels terrible, doesn't it? It feels awful. It's not fair. How could they possibly know these motives? So maybe someone went beyond what they knew and they just started assuming things about you, right? Or maybe someone went beyond or twisted what God's word says to judge you on something in your life. Guys, the, the measure that we use when we're doing this, the measure is God's word and God's word alone here. And what we measure is what we know to be true, it is not what we assume 
or the motives we have attributed to them. And why do we judge at all? Well, I would say that the bent here is that we judge not for judging's sake, but that actually in verse 5, there's this expectation here, right? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This assumes that we're going to help each other, remove these sin issues from each other's life. So we judge to rid ourselves of sin and to confess and to say, I'm sorry, God. And and to help each other bear one another's burdens, bear one another's sin problems. We judge each other to ultimately help each other from costly sin issues. We judge each other to make sure that we are not living hypocritical lives. We judge each other because we want God to be honored by each other's lives. We judge each other because we love one another and we love God. And here's the neat byproduct. If we follow these steps here that Jesus has laid out for us, then the byproduct of us judging one another means that we do step one all the time. We are looking internally all the time at our own sin stuff. We're contemplating that. We're going, God, what is in me? Is that, is that in me? I think that's more in me than I thought it was. It kind of forces us into that humble posture all the time. And I'm convinced that we would actually start dealing with a lot more stuff in our own lives if we were judging one another the way God intends us to. You know, I see this a lot being a parent and looking at my kids. You know, I see them go on and and do something wrong. And then I realize I'm the one who they learned it from. And I'm constantly reflecting on this going, well, I guess if I want to root out impatience, I have to be more patient myself. Well, guys, this isn't just a parent-to-child thing. This is something we're supposed to be doing with one another. That realization that I have with my kids, I should be getting that just as equally and impactfully as, as with each of you. So some takeaways for us here, just to kind of recap. Number one, what Jesus is saying here, judge fellow Christians, okay? We are to judge other Christians this way, right? God judges people outside the church. Number two, before judging, recognize your own huge sin issues and your massive need for Jesus and what he has done for us. Number three, judge humbly. It's not you and Jesus first them. It's you and your brother or sister looking at Jesus together. Number four, judge fairly. Judge what you know, not what you assume. And do not go beyond God's word. It is the measure. And number five, judge to restore. Do it because you love others and you want them to be rid of their sin. And I want to say this. Don't avoid these conversations. Avoiding judging one another, just going, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just take my hat out of the ring here. I'm just not going to judge. I would posit that avoiding judging other Christians might just be as unloving as judging with condemnation. Because it's your own fear of, your, of yourself or having to deal with your own sin issues or I don't know what. There might be lots of reasons why you don't want to judge someone else. Yeah, maybe you just, yeah, don't want to look inside 
and take a peek under your own hood. But guys, that, it, it is unloving to just avoid this altogether. We need one another to lovingly, humbly come alongside and just say, brother, I noticed this. Sister, I noticed this. Could we maybe have a, t- a chat about that? And on the flip side, if you have sin issues, don't wait for someone to notice it. Don't wait for your brother or sister to judge and come help you. Go confess it. Confess it with God, saying what is true. Confess it to someone who you will be able to who will be able to judge you humbly, okay, and walk alongside of you as you look at Jesus together. You know, the coolest thing is that in Jesus there is no condemnation, okay? We can walk with each other and we can judge. We can be a judge, not the judge. But we can judge and we don't have to judge with condemnation because of what Jesus has paid for us on the cross and his resurrection. That's an amazing thing. So we should walk humbly among one another knowing knowing that this stuff does not damn us, this stuff does not condemn us, <laughs> that it's okay to root out your sin. It's preferable. It's needed. It's a must. We don't want the world to look at us and see a bunch of hypocrites sitting here not dealing with our sin and not pointing it out to one another in a loving and humble way, okay? Okay? So it feels like a weird call to action, but I mean, go, go judge each other, okay? <laughs> and I just pray that we are a church that humbles ourselves before we do that and that we love one another to have tough conversations like this, okay? And just remember that whenever we approach Scripture, read our context, not just take bite side bits out of things that we can remember. Do not judge. All right, it's unhelpful. (laughs) All right, let me pray for us, and then we'll close. There's there's coffee and stuff back there, but. God, we just come before you, and we, uh, we acknowledge that we are uh, sinful people. We have lots of sin issues that, by your grace, we have been rescued from and we are not condemned by. But God, we still want to be rid of those things. So please help us be a people who point out the specks, have tough conversations. Let us be a people who receive this judgment with grace, with patience humbly, and let it just cause us to be a people who takes your name seriously and and takes sin very seriously as well, Lord God, and it's something we want no part of. So help us be a church that judges one another non-hypocritically to the glory of your name. May it be holy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, please stick around. There's coffee. Have a great rest of your week, everyone.